You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kivalevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Yitzhak and I have just recorded a, a program about handicapped persons in films, and you're about to hear the conversation we have. I just have to say that uh, Yitzhak reminded me that the first film that we really go into depth about, which is a film with Edward Arnold, directed by Frank Zinneman, uh, I mentioned everybody who's in it and the director. I mentioned the dog and, and all the other side characters, but I didn't mention the name of the film. The name of the film is 1942's Eyes in the Night. So I, I hope that can patch up this conversation. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Clear the aisles, the projectionist has Micha. Hi, I'm here with Yitzhak Kolakowski, and I guess Clear the Isles is a very good subtitle for today because we're going to be talking a little bit about films and television programs where you better clear the aisles for the protagonist because the protagonist ostensibly cannot see and he's going to fall and stumble over things. Now, you might say, well, what, what, what sort of topic is that? Well, we know that blindness in films, and again, you could probably, all of our listeners could probably come up with three or four films in which a blind character was featured prominently. But my point here is, especially as we talk about today and in, in, uh, representation and, and doing things accurately, how many of those characters were actually blind? I don't know. It seems like this has been a put on, whether it's in order to get money or to star in a film. The idea of, of pretending you're blind, especially since often without sophisticated equipment, you couldn't really tell whether a person was really blind or not. And again, just to repeat what I said before, I I wonder if we're going to hear a pushback in today's time that, that all these white faces, all these seeing people appropriated the proper handicap. We could have a, probably a whole series of, we could make a whole podcast, Yitzchuk, out of, you know, handicapped programs that had handicapped individuals who weren't really handicapped. And when we talk about characters in wheelchairs, now, of course, the, the, the exception would be, unfortunately, uh, Lionel Barrymore, who actually needed a wheelchair, although you could see him in some of his early films, uh, walking with, uh, panache and strength. He actually did have some sort of debilitating disease. Uh, I'm not sure what it was exactly. I don't know if it was polio, but something actually affected him. And eventually, of course, he had to be in that wheelchair. And of course, uh, Nebuch, Christopher Reeve, after his accident, uh, played in a remake of Rear Window and some other films where he tried to you know, act and film, of course, but unfortunately in a wheelchair. But there have been so many other actors who, who have been wheelchair bound, supposedly, and were not. I have to, of course, mention this regard, Ironside, which was Raymond Burr's second most famous role, sort of a comeback that he made after Perry Mason was canceled. He came back with a series playing a detective as well, but playing a detective in a wheelchair. Part of what television programs that did feature a handicap, part of it was uh, the struggle was to overcome that handicap and somehow to become a better person and to uh, to bring out the greatness of a person and not to wallow in self-pity. I guess just to throw a couple out there that were probably somewhat effective, I think Audrey Hepburn, of course, Wait Until Dark was a film very loved by Hepburn fans. Uh, it has Richard Crenna playing a villain. You might remember Richard Crenna from The Real McCoys. In, in, in a move away from comedy, plays a, uh, a real oily villain, along with the person who passed away last week, Alan Arkin, who is really a very devious character in that film. One of the things I think that that is developed in a number of these films is that the sightless person or the person with the handicap actually uh his other senses are galvanized and strengthened and in many ways they, they some they somehow become almost supernatural in that way well uh, you know we hit we had the Kaiser from lublin who who was able to see much more. Than than the uh, with that without physical sight in our tradition and in others sometimes you need to be deprived of what we call sight in order to gain second and third sight and those type of real understanding of things and yet <laughs> all that being said you know I, I, I in one sense uh, I, I think that we talk about acting acting blind it's it, you sort of have to learn how to stare 
but not necessarily move your eyes towards the voice of the other person. You have to sort of, st- I think most of these blind actors and actresses, uh, the direction is, okay, you're going to be, you know, keep your head up. Let's have a clear shot of your face and give over the, the, the sort of indicator that you are indeed blind and move in sort of a halting method. Sometimes re- put your hands out. You can tell what sort of directions were given. I, I, I saw a film recently that sort of bucked that s- situation. On one hand, everybody seems to recognize that the character is indeed blind, but he is almost a Superman. He is a super sleuth, a detective. Baynard Kendrick actually wrote a series of uh, detective novels featuring this character, Duncan McLean. And Hollywood thought in 1942 that they could make a series uh, and perhaps do a number of films similar to what I've talked about last year, Errol Flynn's character who wasn't uh, in, in footsteps in the dark. Uh, they thought they could perhaps make a detective series starting Errol Flynn. Here, Hollywood thought they could take the character actor who could sometimes carry a film, Edward Arnold. And I've talked about uh, his very important presence in so many films. But Edward Arnold here is the hero. And he is this blind detective who is sought out by the 1930s starlet, Anne Harding, who took off a number of years from the uh, the mid-30s to the early 40s. She approaches her good friend, Duncan McLean. It does have the usual trope uh, of him feeling her face <laughs> in order to sense what her beauty is. After he feels her face and he realizes who she is, she comes to him with a problem that he needs to solve. And what is it about? Seems to be a very pedestrian type of problem. Her stepdaughter is running around with a very seedy character, uh, an actor, a uh, roustabout fellow that she had been involved with uh, in a previous type of lifetime. And she wants... And the stepdaughter is is certain that that this is just a case of jealousy, and Anne Harding is worried that the stepdaughter, played by Donna Reed in one of her first films, is going to end up in a very bad place, and she suspects that there's something something not right about her former lover. And this is what she brings in Duncan McClay. Now, before she's actually, for that scene, there's an establishing scene where Duncan Edward Arnold, and might be a stunt person, is practicing judo. He's flipping people over again and showing his, his, his ability to fight. And he's, and he's aided by a, a number of comic friends. One of them is Alan Jenkins, who is has been a sidekick in hundreds and hundreds of films. And uh, it sounds like somebody with some sort of former or at least some connection uh, to detective work. And besides Alan Jenkins, uh, there's a character which probably is probably hated when you see him in um, by, by modern black audiences, but he was in a many, many films. Manton Moreland uh, plays his, his butler. I remember him in a lot of movies. The King of the Zombies, he said something about, though, I don't know what that is, but it's not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Edward Arnold has these two, his two helpers who help him through, but his real helper actually who gets pretty high billing in the film is his dog, Friday. And the dog is sort of a German shepherd. It's not exactly. Uh, and uh, the dog is a super dog. The dog understands everything. The dog can open doors. The dog can climb over things. The dog can um, break windows. The The film was directed by Fred Zinneman. Fred Zinneman was about 35, making this film with a, a series of some somewhat, I wouldn't call them necessarily the top, a-listers, but people like uh, Anne Harding had been uh, a, a top-billed actress. Edward Arnold, as I said, had been very, very well known. Uh, but in, in this film, you know, Zinneman uh, puts together a, a sort of middling sort of uh, mystery because it turns out that the stepdaughter is being led astray by a series of, wait for it, Nazi spies who have created this whole fictional acting troupe because they're trying to get close to her because her father 
is some sort of brainy scientist who's developing some sort of super formula that he has hidden in his safe. <laughs> and somehow, if they could, and, and it turns out that even the ex-boyfriend is really part of this whole group of, they never say the word Nazis, they never say the word Germany, I'm not sure exactly why. Barry Nelson is in it, who is of course a, a, a sort of a, a an actor, very famous in the 50s. He plays one of the Nazi henchmen. And, and Catherine Emery plays Shelley, who is the, seemingly the artistic director of this troupe of actors. And yes, she is the head Nazi. Suffice to say that somehow Duncan McLean ends up figuring out something's going on and he shows up and he is going to somehow smash this ring of Nazis primarily by not letting them know how powerful of a detective and how effective he is despite his handicap. In other words, he, 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 he acts like he's the drunken uncle. He acts like he's just a grub. A person who is really just demanding things, but really, of course, he is plotting and incredibly he's able to, you know, with Braille, he's able to, to play cards. He's able to write notes to everyone. And because the Nazis don't realize what he's capable of, he and his dog eventually are able to overcome this threat. It's a little bit too long. It's like, I think they could have done this in about an hour. I, 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 when I was watching this film, something kept on ringing in my head about it. And I said, you know, this reminds me of something. This guy with the dog and he can do judo and, you know, he's able to solve crimes. And I said, this reminds me of a program that I watched in 1971 when the craze of all television detectives based on Ironside was to come, was to give them handicaps. You know, there was Barnaby Jones, who was an old man. There was Cannon, played by William Conrad, who was a fat man. <laughs> there was Columbo, who was sort of, you know, uh, <laughs> sort of a, a off the wall type of super eccentric man. And then there was Longstreet, played by James Franciscus. And I remembered I had seen this film and it was stuck in my memory. I could, uh, I, I did not go back to YouTube to watch the old programs, but I discovered that Sterling Siliphant, the writer, producer, director who was instrumental in writing the first script of Village of the Damned that we talked about a number of weeks ago, used the Edward Arnold film as the basis of his new incarnation of essentially the same character who we called Longstreet. And this was an insurance investigator. Of course, the very first film, and I think you can find it on YouTube, is the is the pilot, which was sort of like the ABC mystery movie, I think it was called, where uh, Franciscus, who has sight, and his wife are going out to dinner. Maybe they're celebrating an anniversary when a bottle arrives at the table and it's opened by the wife, the bottle explodes, killing the wife instantly and blinding uh, Mike Longstreet, the insurance investigator. And the drama of that first 90-minute TV movie was him being able to come back from the blindness to pick himself up from self-pity and his determination to solve the murder. And it was there that they, I guess, ABC decided to try it as a pilot. There was a dog, also called Pax, very similar to Friday, although Friday was black and Pax was white. And there was a secretary and there was, instead of, you know, some comic bozos, there was his therapist who becomes sort of his housekeeper and helper. And incredibly, Bruce Lee is in four of these uh, early episodes Bruce Lee plays Li Tsung, who is a master of Jeet Kune Do, which was actually a form of martial self-defense that Bruce Lee wrote a whole book about. And Bruce Lee in the program would quote passages from his book about the mental idea of Jeet Kune Do. And part of it is 
being able to fail. Part of it is recognizing that you are fragile. Part of it is recognizing that death is, is, is an actuality. But there's a lot of cool Bruce Lee moves. And we talked about it with our good friend Tom in the Green Hornet. Again, training Mike Longstreet to be an effective fighter, to be able to hold his own against the people who want him dead. And it, it, to me, it sort of showed that here it was reignited 30 years later. But now that I'm thinking about it, it's a gimmick, really, isn't it? Right? <laughs> it's a gimmick. Uh, although Longstreet, as a television program, tried to deal with the pain and frustration of somebody being blind. Uh, ultimately, I think the viewer can somehow, I guess, feel in a way positive that they aren't sightless and yet see someone who isn't necessarily the object of pity, somebody who is strong and so determined on their own. And as we said before, it ain't so hard to pull that off, to pull the blind guy off. And so I, I think it probably reaches its apex in Gene Hackman's hilarious take or homage to the blind monk in Bride of Frankenstein, right? Who also seems to be the only one who can sense the monster, the, the, the nobility that the monster has. Yeah. I want to end tonight with a film that your Rebitson is probably one of the reasons I decided to watch it. Yitzhak's wife, of course, is a tremendous fan of the archers. Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, who rightly are considered uh, the greatest of English filmmakers. And in a film that is called The Small Back Room from 1949, David Farrar stars as Sammy Rice, who is a an expert in weaponry, an expert in the science of weaponry. And yet they are dedicating themselves to the country, trying to develop the most effective weaponry and the most effective defense systems. They're in a back room where people don't really notice them. They don't have the shiny office near Buckingham Palace like everyone else. The protagonist is also handicapped. Now, his handicap is that he has a, uh, that he's lost a leg. You never see him. You never see the metal leg, but David Farrar walks with a limp throughout the film. But instead of it being a gimmick, it's a symbol, really. A symbol, his, his handicap is really a psychological symbol of his own sense of being inadequate. Uh, there is a, an idea perhaps that, you know, he, this, this is a, a metaphor for his manhood. And he, because of the pain, of probably losing the leg probably has, he has turned to drink. And the first scene where you can find him, he's in a bar and it's a, a, a beautifully shot scene. The, the verite of a bar in, 19, in 1943 England, he drinks because of his pain, because of his frustration. And that's really paralleled by the time period that the film is set 1943, where England was, in a way, losing the war. The Allies were collapsing. There was there was the Free French, but most of France had already been taken over by the Nazis, and the it was the expatriates that that had were populating England. It's 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 quite strange because it is 1943. It's the middle of the war, and yet most of the scenes of London are. You can't really tell. People are not necessarily crying. People aren't running away. There isn't any bombings that happen. And I think that itself is is quite novel. You know you're in the middle of the war, but there aren't any battle scenes. There's plenty of people in uniform, but it really gives you a sense. And I think Pressburger and Powell were able to look back at what it was really like to go through the war. And, and, and the film is really a commentary, I think, on the overextended aspects of bureaucracy in England, uh, the competing sort of commissions and programs that really clutter the potential for direct, straight in, uh, involvement of fighting and also really clutter and confuse interpersonal relationships. 
it, it's really a comment on on English society and how it needed to come together in a stronger way. Harar's character uh, is somebody who is, in a way, giving in to his demons by drinking, but in his apartment, in the other small back room, the small back room of his house, which, <laughs> you know, he sort of shares although, you know, the film sort of skirts from this with his secretary, played by Kathleen Byron, but she sort of is her is his caretaker. She isn't going to let him drink in his house. The only thing he's allowed to do is take painkillers, which they call dope in this film. And the dope somehow doesn't do what's necessary. The, the opioids don't seem to be able to really stop him because it isn't just the pain of his leg it's the frustration of himself as a human being that he's fighting against. I think here the handicap, a his his the fact that he has this his leg that he is he's afraid to take that leg off at work. He's afraid to ease his pain. He's afraid to be vulnerable. All of these things are really aspects that he has to overcome. There is sort of an expressionist type of nightmare that he has when he believes his his girlfriend has is not showing up and has left him, and, and that shows really how much he needs to have another person to help him through. Pressburger and Powell take us to a lot of interesting locations. The tank weapon is being tested in in Stonehenge, incredibly. They also the the ultimate penultimate scene happens in a place called Chesil Beach which is an incredibly shore, and it's really one of the most beautiful, uh, austere places in England where the Germans have dropped this bomb. Uh, again, these are little containers that look like thermoses, and the symbolism of a bottle, <laughs> similar to the liquor bottle that stays in his in his apartment, there's always the bottle that needs to be somehow drained of its negative capabilities there's the drink that that he can't submit to and there's also the thermos bomb that the germans have perfected the one that they're dropping all over england hoping to sow terror as small children will be attracted to it and this is of course why you know he gets called in on this in order to prop to solve how they can somehow diffuse these tricky devils and and one of the last scenes in the film that is done so incredibly, he, after a night of basically submitting himself to drink and thinking that all was lost, when he gets a call from the officer who discovered these thermos bombs, that he should go out to Chesil Beach. And he finds out that the officer who called him himself tried to defuse one of the bombs and was blown to bits he takes it upon himself to defuse the second bomb. And Pressburger and Powell build the tension in such an incredible way, very similar to if you've seen the end of Failsafe with Henry Fonda and Larry Hagman in that room uh, where uh, the president is speaking to the premier of Russia, where Larry Hagman is giving you the voice because he's an expert translator. And this is sort of the way the, that, that the, the tension is building. It isn't just exposition. I'm very many years earlier in the small back room, as Farrar, Sammy Rice is trying to defuse the bomb. He's talking through a remote telephone to the other officers, primarily an actress that had a very long career, Renee Asherson. Renee Asherson, in one of her early roles, uh, is hearing uh, his communication, and she is writing it down in her shorthand and saying it over to the rest of the officers there. But for us, it's really a break from exposition, pure exposition of the hero. It it somehow is not disconcerting at all. It it really creates uh, a, a sense of a multi view of of courage, a multi, uh, a, a, a variegated sense of how 
a person can overcome something, where you see it from the point of view of 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 Sammy, who's on, who's lying on the beach, who who's who's who needs to use the power of his legs to be able to hold himself steady, uh, to be able to have the strength in his hands and the and the smarts to figure out how to defuse this bomb. You can go subtle. You can use the handicaps that the people around us have as really a metaphor for much of what all of us need to overcome without necessarily trotting it out as a way to to sort of have another gimmick. The film wouldn't be the same if Sammy didn't have this metal leg. He would probably have been in uniform. He probably would have, he wouldn't have had the 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 the, the issues with his secretary and with the people around him. Uh, he would have been able to assert himself more, but 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 it isn't really there to zero in on a guy who is lame. It's really it, it really uses the infirmity as a way to reach into every viewer and to think about what we sometimes use as excuses for not being stronger excuses for letting things go excuses because there's an inevitability of things we won't be able to change and i think in that way it really you know it it, it shouldn't bother anyone that david farrar himself was himself not lame i think mean, that's where we really have to ask the question how much of his is 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 it, is it exploitive look as a as a brother of someone who was developmentally disabled it sometimes bothers me when i do see films trotting out characters in order to either ring the bell for sympathy or somehow, you know, use them without really investing them with any real humanity. If we would live in a world where the only people who could play these parts were people who were themselves limited, and they were the only ones who could convey that, I think that we would be often not be able to absorb and understand properly yeah i mean it, you know i i remember you know as a, as a as a child there would be the the deaf you know actors appearing on sesame street or then you had there was the show life goes on it was the character porky who, who was played by chris burke who actually has down syndrome so you know sometimes sometimes you know there there's a, a time and a place i think for all these, these different ones. I remember there was a, a, bio, a biopic of Alexander Graham Bell was made for TV that I really loved called The Sound of the Silence. I think we, I spoke about it once. And uh, Bell's wife, uh, who in real life was deaf, uh, I believe was played by a deaf woman. It seems like that handicap, deafness, is something that people, those actors have had, a, I think, an easier time playing those roles. Mary Matlin, of course, um, uh, is, is children of a lesser God and, you know, consistently played someone who could not hear. And I think recently in the very successful Hulu series called Murders in the Building, the character who plays Nathan Lane's son, who is deaf, is actually a deaf actor. I think because of ALS, there is somehow it is easier to be able to use uh, a, a deaf actor in the way that the screenwriter and the director want to. I think it's 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 very different, especially if let's say uh, you are trying to deal with someone who has lost their legs. Let's say like Tom Cruise in and and Born on the Fourth of July, or even Gary Sinise in Forrest Gump where these are characters that have lost their legs in war and now have to struggle with that bitterness. How can you have a, an actor, you know, <laughs> play a walking person and then a person who isn't walking? Uh, I, guess, I guess I guess the movie that I'll very briefly talk about, I guess, can maybe give an answer to that. And you wanted to talk about Night Monster. Yeah, a, a very strange, strange movie from 1942, Universal Pictures. Directed by Ford Beebe, who mostly I I was familiar with him directing a lot of serials, but this movie is a very interesting movie because Bela Lugosi gets top billing even though he has 
relatively minor role as a butler in one of these big, you know, old dark houses where a bunch of murders are happening all against doctors. Lionel Atwell was one of the doctors who was, comes victim of the murder. And we don't know exactly who is committing the murders. There's a, a constable played by Robert Homans who's trying to figure out, you know, who, who, who done it. I think Don Porter is the, uh, is the, is the detective, right? Right. Yeah, he's more, he's more of a private detective and, and Homans is the, is the actual police presence. So between the two of them, trying to figure this out. And there's way too many characters in such a short movie. I saw this movie on the big screen last year in, uh, in Ohio, uh, monster bash. They do a program in Ohio and it's, it's a different type of movie, but there's one character played by Ralph Morgan who is in a wheelchair throughout the movie. And he is being treated by a, a, a Hindu character played by a, a white actor. So here you have, he's not wearing a black face or anything, but he is wearing a turban. Uh, Niles Astor playing Agor Singh. And he's training this Kirk Ings, Kurt Ingston played by Ralph Morgan to meditate different things and, and to be able to manifest things through med- through meditation. So one of the clues w- with the murders is footprints. And there's some discussion, is Kurt Ingston, who's in a wheelchair, actually able to walk? And is he pretending to have this disability? Then they find out that he actually doesn't have any legs. And so it's not there's no way for him to walk because he has no legs. But then in the end of the movie, we find out, I guess I can... Boy, we're alert here that somehow yeah. he, he can manifest legs, right? Through-, yeah, through, through Through this meditation that he learned from Angor Singh. He was able to manifest legs, but then he he wanted to murder all of the doctors who put him into this predicament. In other words, right. So here again, you you sort of have, again, fighting against a terrible reality, vengeance, the inability to accept, right? And turning to, once again, like the supernatural, Duncan McLean, Mike Longstreet, and (laughs) in your case, Kurt Ingston. (laughs) <laughs> they are all sort of super uh, handicappers, right? They're they're handicappers who who have moved beyond. They aren't necessarily models for us, right? They're someone who have somehow uh, they're way beyond. They're they they are heroes that are golden, or somehow they have tapped into the mystic arts uh, to turn themselves into in, into monstrous killers. I, I think, like, like you say, in those ways, I'm not sure how much that really helps. The, the 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 people in our in our community who are handicapped who see it i think part of why the miracle worker is such an effective film is because it stresses not so much helen keller but annie sullivan you know it stresses how much annie sullivan is able to become a stronger person through what she has done with with helen keller that's what we want after we've gone through the escape of film is to come out feeling armed with something that can allow us to overcome, allow us to have strength, allow us to, to be able to push forward despite difficulties that life consistently rolls at us. Well, that's the question. What's the, which is the bigger, bigger miracle to, to be able to, you know, literally miraculously or, or, you know, through, I know you could, you could argue, you know, I know a lot of the Eastern traditions, they argue it's actually some sort of a technology. It's just science hasn't reached it there. Is that really the miracle? Or is really the miracle, that, like you said, the chesed of, of an Annie Sullivan, of someone who's able to believe in someone and give them a second chance, give them the chance they never had? Yes, what is the miracle? And I think when we have, you know, Anne Bancroft's character is Annie Sullivan slapping Patty Duke and, and pushing her to go beyond what the comfort level of, of, of acting like an ignoramus of not knowing when Catherine Byron uh, slaps uh, David Farrar's character and tells him to assert himself that he can be something. I think that all of us can feel that slap. We can feel that slap when we, we, when we feel that we're not being exploited. And I think that's the balance where we are drawn 
like a freak show. We're always drawn to persons who, who are bearded ladies, who are gargantuan in size, who have a third eye. <laughs> All of this is somehow we are drawn to the to things that are different and strange. And I think Hollywood and, and television, you know, they have to walk a, a, a thin, you know, a very balanced line when they want to present the stories of persons who are who who because of birth or because of accident have uh, unfortunately been handicapped in that way. They're either superhuman or cretins. And I think Pal and Pressburger were able to come up with a recipe. So watch your step on the way out. We'll catch you next time. Be well. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode. 